Could you give a very warm welcome, please, to Seamus Mill and his colleagues in the garden? Seamus. Thanks very much, uh, Jeremy, and thanks for all of you for coming tonight and queuing to get into this uh, exceptionally secure building. Um, I mean, this meeting is supposed to be about a new year of war, and it is certainly an alarming and dangerous picture and th that, we've, that we face uh, in terms of global conflict, which is spreading and growing all the time. Ten days ago, we saw the atrocities in France, which, as in the case of similar events here, are quite clearly the product of the past 13 years of the war on terror and France's role in it in particular. And they are both fueling anti-Semitism and rampant Islamophobia uh, as they, these uh, interventions go. We've seen in response to the French attacks already, the French government sending a new warship to the Gulf and clamping down on civil liberties and Muslim community activists in France. And here in Britain, Cameron, David Cameron, is demanding more surveillance powers. And I was just listening on the radio as I came down here to his response to the complaints from the Muslim Council of Britain today about the letter sent out to mosques across Britain. He, said, and he was saying it's completely reasonable that they make clear their allegiance to Britain. Uh, everything and anything is the cause of this and these uh, attacks, except the one thing, the elephant in the room, which everyone else in the world can see, but not the government's concern, which is the wars they are waging in the Arab and Muslim world. We've got conflicts multiplying on three continents. In an arc of war, military intervention, and state breakdown from <coughs> Afghanistan to Nigeria. In Iraq and Syria, the so-called Islamic State, the mutant offspring of the war on terror, is now the, the renewed target of United States, British, and French military intervention. In Ukraine, thousands have died in proxy fighting between Russian-backed rebels and the NATO-sponsored uh, government in Kiev. And in the Far East as well, you've got tensions rising between China and US uh, and the US and its allies in the region as the US tries to maintain its control of a whole part of the globe. And in most of these conflicts, the British government and British forces are in the thick of it and making matters worse, uh, I would argue, in the process. Now, the current conflicts in the Arab and Muslim world in particular I would say are the, the product of the failure of the first phase of the war on terror. Because in Afghanistan and Iraq, we saw how the United States and Britain and their allies demonstrated the limits of American and Western strategic power rather than its extent. And we saw that reflected in the withdrawal from Iraq, in Britain, the case of British troops from Basra in the middle of the night, and a few weeks ago from Afghanistan, the withdrawal of, of regular troops was held in secret for fear of Taliban attacks. But they're not letting go, of course. We've got the return to Iraq uh, taking place right now with 13,000 uh, trainers, in Af US trainers, so-called trainers in Afghanistan, and thousands of troops returning to Iraq in uh, special forces, uh, in bombing raids, uh, and in so-called advising and training role, roles. And of course, in response to the Arab uprisings, the so-called Arab Spring in 2011, there was an attempt by the United States and, West, and its Western allies to regain their foothold and their dominance in the region through a process of trying to crush the uprisings, to hijack them or to divert them. And that happened in, Syria, in, in Libya first, in Bahrain, as Jeremy's referred to, in Syria through proxy wars, and in Yemen. And the result throughout the region has been intensified civil war, the return of the most 
brutal dictatorship in Egypt and the strengthening of the autocratic authoritarian Gulf regimes on which Western power in the Middle East uh, depends. They are sponsoring and at the same time fighting different groups of rebels in, in Syria. And only a few weeks ago, the British government proudly announced at this most fraught and dangerous of times that 40 years after the withdrawal from the so-called East of Suez, the withdrawal of British forces permanently from the Gulf under the, a Labour government in the late 1960s, they were returning to the region in force. There will now be a new military, British military base in Bahrain, just as the French government set one up recently in the United Arab Emirates to protect security and so-called stability uh, in the region. Uh, this Bahraini regime that the British government is supporting and standing behind has repressed its own people in the most <coughs> brutal way. Uh, and uh, the most that they'll admit is that there are human rights issues which need discussion and debate as the base uh, is set up. Now, if the Middle East maelstrom that we've been talking about is the uh, fruit of the attempts to re-establish the United States dominated order in the region. Ukraine and the Ukrainian war, you could say, is the result of the challenge to the unipolar world that started to break down in the process of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it was precisely the attempt by NATO and the Western powers to draw Ukraine into the Western camp and to expand NATO, an alliance which was supposed to be a defensive one, right up to the Russian border into the heartlands of the former Soviet Union. That triggered this crisis and that led to the overthrow of the elected president a year ago uh, in Kiev. And that has triggered a full-scale regional war uh, which now involves far-right-wing militias fighting uh, in eastern Ukraine backed by the British government, the United States, and other Western powers. So far from keeping the peace, NATO has shown itself to be a threat to peace in that entire region. And the war on terror that was launched in the autumn of 2001 has now become a permanent war in a sort of Orwellian mold, where it's a war without end, where every response and every intervention escalates the war and a, a constructed, politically constructed national security trumps the actual security of citizens every time and feeds a campaign of Islamophobia and an, an, an attempt to discipline and intimidate the Muslim community that we're seeing played out in this country every single day. At the same time as liberties are torn up uh, for all of us. And that war is clearly growing and spreading again. We're no longer talking about hundreds of thousands of troops and boots on the ground as took place in Iraq and <coughs> Afghanistan in the first phase of the war on terror. So the torture and kidnapping that we saw played out in the CIA report so graphically a few weeks ago is now being replaced by mass drone attacks carried out through a whole wave of countries. The use of special forces and trainers, new bases, air attacks, bombing campaigns and covert wars. That is how it's being played out now from Pakistan to Yemen, Kenya to Somalia, Mali to Libya, Iraq and Syria to Afghanistan. And as the former French Prime Minister, Dominique de Villepin, who became famous all over the world in 2003 for the adamant refusal uh, that he expressed of the French government to join the illegal aggression uh, against Iraq in 2003. As he said uh, last week in the frenzy of the post uh, Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris, that ISIS, the so-called Islamic State, is the direct product of Western policy, uh, policy and military interventions, and its military campaigns are boosting it. As he said directly, the West's wars always, always nourish new wars and terrorism amongst us. 
which I think sums the situation up very graphically. But one of the problems we've got here, and it's very appropriate that we're holding this meeting here in Parliament, is that all the three main political parties, leaderships, support the broad thrust of this war on terror and its various manifestations. It's perfectly correct that the Labour Party played a, a powerful role in pulling back from the attack on Syria that was going to be launched in the autumn of 2013. And Ed Miliband criticised the war in Iraq and distanced the Labour leadership from that. But they are now putting their weight behind the new uh, Bahrain base. They supported, of course, the intervention in Libya and the new campaign in Iraq. It means there's a democratic deficit on policies which affect this country crucially, but do not, by and large, have the support of the British people, or, by the way, the peoples of most of the other intervening countries as well. So, the support for dictatorship, which we've seen played out in the last few years, and the support for these wars is not something that's either in the interests of the region, of the people of the Arab and Muslim world where the wars are carried out, or in the interests of the people of the countries and the states doing those interventions. But it's become, I think, more difficult to campaign and mobilise over these issues because of the fact that there are fewer troops. And for many people, the wars have become so complicated, they're lost in what's actually uh, going on. But in the interest of justice and security, and of course, community relations in this country and, and many others, it's more important than ever. So the public pressure that brought the troops home from Iraq and Afghanistan and stopped the attack on Syria in 2013 has to be has to get much stronger and be ramped up much more if this process and this brutal and spreading war without end isn't to engulf us all thanks very much Rob.